Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, are about leadership, personal growth, and creating a superior culture of excellence, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today is the very popular newscaster and radio host of 94.7 Kumu. She is Esme Infante, and today we are going beyond radio. Hey, Esme, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Hey, how's it? Hi, Rusty. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that you and I both grew up in Mililani, but I want to know about your background and what you did when you are those early years growing up in Mililani. Oh, gosh. So um, actually, before I grew up in Mililani, uh, the first few years, of course, I, I, uh, my family comes from Kalihi area, uh, Kalihi Palama, um, Punui area. But then we moved to Mililani when I was about six. And I, we lived here and that Mililani is pretty much my hometown. Uh, for anybody who's familiar with Mililani, Mililani Wa'ena. And then I'm, I'm of the age that we got bused to Wheeler Intermediate back in the day. So that was my intermediate school. And then Mililani High School uh, is my alma mater. And uh, at Mililani High School, I, uh, golly, I loved going there. That is the school that my Siblings also attended, that my children have attended. Uh, my, my son goes there now as a sophomore. My daughter uh, is uh, just graduated last year. But I, I loved it at Mililani High School. At Mililani, I was uh, involved in a whole bunch of clubs. I also played softball. But mostly, I was a, a band geek. I was a major band geek. I was the queen of the band geeks, in fact. Um, I was a drum major. I was also a yearbook editor, um, which was the beginning of my journalism career. And um, yeah, that was, that was the beginning of an of, of, of incredible series of adventures uh, at Mililani High School. And from there, I went to uh, the University of Hawaii. And that is where I majored and graduated with distinction in journalism. And that launched my career. So Esme, outside yes. of family, what was the first job that you ever had that you got paid money for? Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, the distinction is got paid money for, right? Okay, because <laughs> um, actually my family runs, uh, we used to, uh, my mom had a business running, um, a, so like a seamstress business. So for 25 years, our whole family did that. I don't know if that considered, that's considered being paid because, um, you know, when your mom says you got to do, you got to do it right. No more choice. So um, that was really technically my first job. We learned to be uh, salespeople, you know, customer service from the time we were toddlers and uh, grew up in that business. But if you're talking about the first job outside of that, uh, where I actually got a paycheck in my hands, um, I guess that would be uh, McDonald's in our hometown, Rusty, uh, here in Midilani. Um, I was a crew member at McDonald's on Kamehameha Highway uh, up across from the golf course. And oh my gosh, the lessons that I learned there. It is a humbling job. Props to anybody who's watching who has worked at McDonald's or is working at McDonald's right now because it is, it is hard work. Um, I learned so many lessons there. I, uh, I, I find when I think back that definitely my work at McDonald's reinforced the lessons that I, my parents initially taught me, but it really was you know, um, something that was profound to learn and have reinforced the work ethic that they reinforce at McDonald's. So things like you are always working, there's always something to do. Oh, you don't have a customer right now? Go stock the condiments. Oh, condiments already done? Go check the coffee maker, go make coffee. Oh, the coffee maker's done? Go check the fry station. You know what I mean? Like there's always something that needs to be done. And so uh, shout out to uh, everybody at McDonald's for teaching me some fantastic life lessons. Well, as me, I, I know that McDonald's very well. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I've been there many times and I, you know, your kids right now, I mean, they, they, they're all grown up. Uh, how are they doing? Good, good. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, my daughter graduated from Midlani High School last year, 2020, which was a pandemic year. 
By the way, also shout out to Midlani High School for doing an amazing job in a pandemic year of uh, continuing to educate our kids and doing an amazing job with graduation last year, which I'm sure they will do again this year. Um, now my daughter is studying culinary uh, with UH and loving it. And I am reaping the benefits because my house is filled with food every single night. <laughs> Ter terrible for my diet though, I have to say, but, but uh, yummy for the taste buds. Uh, my son is at Midlani High School. Of course, during this pandemic, they're doing uh, mostly distance learning. Uh, but my son has been very involved in the band as well. My daughter was very involved in the band too. So that is another like Mililani slash Infante family kind of a thing. We all, my siblings also got into band. So um, yeah, we love the program over there. And it's shaped, I think it's shaped the characters of people in my family, my kids. And, and so they just do an amazing job there. So yeah, I, all those particular experiences all were formative, I think, to character. Go Trojans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Esme, you know, a lot of yeah. people know you, um, just they know your voice through radio, but you know, some of them, they, they don't get to see you. So I think this is a great opportunity. And I want to ask you, you know, looking back on your life so far, mm -hmm. what's a big adversity that you had to deal with? Oh, gosh, uh, adversity. Life is adversity, right? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, perfectly honest. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that comes to mind when you ask me about that is, um, so as I mentioned earlier, I graduated from the University of Hawaii in journalism. And I imagined in my head, because I graduated in print journalism, print journalism, meaning an emphasis on uh, newspapers, magazines, et cetera. That was my area of emphasis. I actually, when I started at UH, I meant to focus on broadcast journalism. I wanted to become a news anchor. And um, one of my very awesome professors, uh, Beverly Kiever advised me, she said, um, you know, you can learn on camera later, get into print journalism so that you can learn the research, the media law, the editing, the, the really tight writing and research, um, civics, uh, ethics, all, all the things that go into really heavy duty investigative journalism, that was what they were emphasizing that particular program at that time. And so, um, and so I did, I, I majored in print journalism instead. Um, when you ask about adversity, I, I think in a nutshell, the adverse, the first one that pops to mind for me is having to pivot. Um, after I worked at the Honolulu Advertiser, so I started at UH and came, I, I was one of the Honolulu, ad, back when it was the Honolulu advertiser, not the Star advertiser, and we were a two newspaper town. Um, I was one of their youngest hires ever. I was hired when I was still a senior at, high, in, at UH and uh, became one of their youngest ever full-time hires. And, um, and I worked there for, <clears throat> I'm going to date myself, I'm going to age myself, but uh, decades. <laughs> I was there a good long while. Um, I thought that was going to be, like I thought I was gonna be a lifer. You know, just uh, there were a lot of people who had worked decades uh, at particular news agencies. What no one could really see coming was the way digital and, the, and, and all the other evolutions in the media industry would change the way we do our work, would change the industry, would upend so many um, media organizations. So the biggest adversity at that point that I faced was in 2010, the Honolulu Advertiser closed, closed. And even though people, I think, believed that the two newspapers were merging, they actually did not necessarily merged. They did not keep everybody. There were hundreds of us who one minute we thought we were lifers in the newspaper industry. The next minute, hundreds of us were on the street with no job. And Hawaii being so small, no job prospects. What were you going to do? Where were you going to find another newspaper job? It was, it was stunning, especially for people who had defined themselves by their work in, in journalism. That was really difficult. Um, I, there were many people who, to be perfectly honest, like really crashed and burned, um, had a really hard time with that transition. The challenge for me was, I mean, I had kids, I had to, you know, figure out a way to keep going. And um, so in, when the paper, between the paper closing in 2010, and over the ensuing, mm, let's say eight years, I went through 
I think four or five career reinventions. So from the start, from, from going to, uh, you know, leaving the Honolulu advertiser behind, um, I began my own company. I learned to become an entrepreneur. I, I founded and began a company called Moms in Hawaii. That was a social media and uh, promotions uh, and PR company. Uh, I ran that for three years. And man, when you are an entrepreneur, you are everything from CEO to janitor, man. Like you just, whoo, that is baptism by fire, fire. Uh, so that was, and I did that for three years. I came out of that and I became communications director for Congressman Takai. He asked me to come on board when he was elected to Congress. Suddenly it was flying between here and Washington, D.C., learning how to be on the PR side of the media equation of, of, of communication. Uh, from there, I went to become, I needed to, I got divorced about that time. So I had to reinvent myself again because I needed to find work closer to home. I had full custody of my kids. So I needed to find work that kept me here at home. So I got a job at Mililani High School. God bless Fred Murphy, who's the principal there. Uh, he hired me to start the broadcast journalism program there. I had never been a classroom teacher. I had to get my certification and teach in the classroom and handle 180 students and learn to teach journalism and English and health all at the same time. And I'm not saying that in a bragging way. I'm saying that in a, oh my gosh, that was so overwhelming. Um, there were many days that I came home at the end of the, uh, my first year teaching, I would come home and go, go up in the bathroom and go, <gasps> what am I doing? Like just, you know, like that was just a crazy, crazy time. Um, I taught at Mililani High School for three years, really proud of what we did with the journalism program there um, and, uh, and turned out some fabulous students and fabulous products. Um, at the same time, I was working part time at Kumu, 94.7 Kumu, because somewhere in the back of my mind, it was always a dream to do morning radio. And I, I, I can't tell you why that always was a dream that I had just kind of stuck in on the back burner for many, many years. But one after I had worked, I was almost going to quit. I was like four years working part-time on the weekends and evenings at 94.7 Kumu. And then one day I got the call. Devin called me and he goes, you know what? We have an opening. Do you want to join the morning show? And I went, oh my God. So that was, that's, that was the journey. That was the adversity. And, and, and I made it sound like a cheerful story just to make it entertaining, but there was so much, so much struggle along that path to um, learn new skills. I had to learn new skills on the fly, OTJ training, right? On the job training, um, just learning as I go trying to quiet the voices in my head going, are you crazy? You don't know how to do this. <laughs> You're gonna have to learn it as you go. And um, that, that was really a challenge. Um, I can't tell you how many days I lay in bed with my eyes open going, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> For real, what am I doing? <laughs> but um, so I, you know, and like I said, in the midst of all of that, the divorce happened uh, in the midst of all of that, you know, changing jobs so many times. Um, and that added a, an extra layer. My parents also got older. My father went through a number of illnesses and then finally passed a couple of years ago. There was a lot of adversity happening all at the same time. Um, some days I'm surprised I'm still breathing. I'll be really honest. Well, you know, as, as me, I, I'm, I mean, that's so admirable how, you know, you really had to reinvent yourself. You had to adjust and adapt and then, you know, mm -hmm. and being a single mom, I mean, uh, very admirable. And, you know, you mentioned Devin Nicoba and you guys make such a great team. What, oh, why thanks. is it that you guys make such a great team? <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because, um, so, okay, so let me just clear up some, uh, a, a, a very common misconception about Devin and I first. Devin and I are dear friends. We are not a married couple. I can't <laughs> tell you how many times we're out in public and people go, you guys aren't married. No, that's like, that's like if somebody said you were asked if you were married to your sister or your brother or something, it's like, ew, that's so gross. Um, <laughs> the thing with Devin and I is that we, we have known each other uh, more than 20 years. Uh, we, so it, it, outside of my professional uh, journalism slash 
uh, PR slash promotions, marketing, emceeing life. The other thing that I do is performing arts. So I've done a lot of community theater. I've been a, a dance director, choreographer, and teacher. Um, I know Devin from the performing arts world. We, when Lisa Matsumoto's plays, um, the Pigeon English comedy plays were running at Diamond Head Theater. That's, that's, he was in one that I was in uh, in the 90s. Uh, and that was where we first met. We did a number of shows together since then. Um, so we have uh, not only decades of history together, but we have a common set of friends and, a, and, you know, and I know his family, he knows my family. That means we have blackmail material. <laughs> 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 but so I, I you know, it's, so we can draw on a lot of that. And I think a lot of the chemistry between you and I is, is from that, is from just years of um, a common group of friends, a common family, a common language. Also, I think um, as, this is true of, I think, anybody, whether you're talking about, you know, Good Morning America or, um, you know, or local daily shows, you know, like, um, like Hawaii News Now's awesome sunrise show. Um, everybody who works a show where they have to be on screen, on camera every single day, or like with Devin and I, we're on the mic every single day, five hours a day, sitting across each other in a studio where we only have each other to depend on, but also irritate each other. Um, <laughs> you learn really quickly. I think you have to be, um, you learn the concept of grace. You learn the concept of forgiving each other and knowing the distinction between what's a small little irritation or something that you know, it, it's going to pass in a minute. It's not worth getting hung up on versus big rocks, you know, big things that you need to spend time talking about later is a big issue. Um, there are very few, we, Devin and I have been doing the morning show together, just me and him now for, I think, two years. I think we've talked about everything, <laughs> any big rocks, any big issues. Um, but that's not to say that that it's not challenging. It is, it is challenging, I think it, but I know that he has extended to me as much forgiveness and grace as I have had to extend to him. So it's a, you know, it's a it's a mutual, mutual forgiveness thing, I think. So I think that it's so it's chemistry and history together with grace and forgiveness. I think that's what keeps us going. Well, I, I love listening to you guys on the radio. And I want to you. ask you, as me. You know, yes. is one of the best, most favorite things of your job meeting celebrities? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that, you know, I didn't get into journalism to meet celebrities. My, and, I, you know, a little bit later in this, in this talk story, we'll talk about, like, purpose. Um, but meeting celebrities is definitely a nice, fun side perk of, of, you know, doing journalism and being in touch with the community and, um, and just being out there. Um, I, I know you've shown some pictures there of, of meeting, you know, people like Jack Johnson and, and Janet Jackson and Kelly Hu. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about interviewing celebrities and, and other people have interviewed Harrison Ford, the actor, uh, Margaret Cho, the comedian, Lance, Lance Bass from NSYNC, um, a, a number of people and politicians and like the, the late uh, Senator Inouye, Daniel Inouye. Um, the thing that I love the most about interviewing people of import is as soon as you, the interviewer, get over your butterflies and your kind of like, you know, like your, your sparkles in the eyes kind of stage, and you just start talking as humans, there's so much to learn. There's so, so much to learn from people. And um, for example, like I, I love, like that was the set, that picture you showed of uh, meeting Jack Johnson, that was actually the second time that I had met him. Um, he has, he carries himself with so much grace, like a certain humility. And he has, he has the world at his feet. He has, his music is so popular. He does so much good work in the community, um, but he carries himself with so much humility. And just that example is something to learn from. Janet Jackson, um, it was such an interesting story with her. She, when I got to meet her, I, was it last fall, the previous year, just before the pandemic hit, um, I think every woman who is of petite stature might be able to relate to this story. So Janet Jackson, I had heard, was a petite woman. And I'm five feet tall. People are surprised. I say I'm five feet tall because I usually wear heels. So they think I'm like five, 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 six. I'm actually five feet tall. But here's the thing. So I walk in to go meet Janet Jackson and I had heard that she's tiny. She really is physically this very, very petite woman, but the presence 
the presence of that woman. Like you walk into the room and you know who is in charge of that room. You know she knows exactly what needs to be done, what she wants to be done, what is her mission in life, her purpose for being. And that is powerful. So I think I didn't I didn't mean that it's the story only pertains to Asian women. I mean anybody who has ever felt either physically or emotionally or or cognitively quote unquote smaller in stature, you need not be. If you know what your purpose is, you can command a room. It's it's powerful. It is so powerful. So anyway, going back to the question about meeting celebrities, I think every time I meet one of them, once again, once that sort of like that, you know, that that oh my God moment uh, wears off, the opportunity to learn from them is, is tremendous. Well, Esme, I like hearing those insights about that. And you're so right. And I know that you read my, uh, my first book and uh, did you like it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I'm not saying that just because we're friends. Um, <laughs> I really, you know what I, I, what I love about the book is, and I'm looking for, I'm, I have to say, I have not read the second one yet. I'm excited to get it. And I'm waiting also because I know Rusty's going to sign me one. Yes, um, for but, sure. <laughs> but the first book, what I, what I love about it is the way that you bring really important concepts that can apply, that come from real life and can be applied in the corporate setting, but also can be applied in your family, can be applied in your interpersonal relationships. Um, love that very much. I am particular, as you can guess from, you know, the topics that we've talked about so far, my favorite, you, you laid out these, you know, these eight keys for leadership and building a team. I think my favorite chapter is the chapter, I think it's chapter seven, uh, the one about um, uh, uh, not only overcoming adversity, but like, embracing it like expecting adversity that's something that i didn't grow up hearing a lot like expect that things are going to go wrong expect that you're going to have a challenge um that's something that i learned as i've gone again on the job training right um so i appreciated that in your book that you devoted a chapter to to saying expect that there is going to be adversity and then i really like the way like i feel like there's a theme in there in the book about it's like it's what you tell yourself about the adversity you know you can change a narrative i think there's a story in that chapter about adversity where um you talked about a particular student that you had coached and he was feeling a lot of nerves because um he was feeling a lot of pressure to win and you flipped the script for him you helped him understand that he didn't have to feel pressured out it's what he was telling himself in his head about the challenge he was facing. You can flip the script for yourself, tell yourself a different story. And for him, he was pressuring out because he was like, oh, I feel so much pressure to win. Um, and, and Coach Rusty told him, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is you, you haven't won anything yet. You have only to go up, you know what I mean? And that was it. And all of a sudden he went, that's right. I didn't, I didn't win anything yet. I have, I have, nothing to lose, everything to gain, basically. And that changed this whole confidence game, right? So um, that that is one of my favorite parts of the book, is just learning yeah. how to see it in a different light. Yeah, it's, it's a mindset and it's, you know, recognizing yeah. necessary pressure versus unnecessary pressure is, you know, what you mentioned there. And mm -hmm. I know, Esme, that you, you guys are in the studio a lot, but you love going outside the studio where Kumu goes into the community what do you love about that the most? Oh gosh, I think that is another thing that when I when I thought about what it would be like to be a, a radio morning show newscaster and host, um, I did not realize that such a big chunk of, well, I'm sorry, take it back. During the pandemic, it's been a little bit different, but previous to that, a big chunk of our job uh, is going out into, into the community uh, to host events and uh, the, the great majority of them are in support of really worthy causes. I think that is one of the things that I'm most proud of. Um, uh, the Great Aloha Red, you saw, us, uh, saw me interviewing Carol Kai there. Um, she has done an amazing, she's another celebrity who I've learned so much just from you know interacting with her and learning from her example. Um, 
Uh, but supporting the Great Aloha Run, uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation is another organization that 94.7 Kumu has been in partnership with a lot. And uh, we have hosted their telethon every year, their radiothon. Uh, we've uh, been the host, uh, one of their hosts, actually, I'm sorry, the host station uh, for um, their Jingle Rock Run. Um, we have been out in the community doing school supply drives uh, to support the school tools initiative. Um, so many different things that we've been able to help make happen in the community worthwhile causes. And that is definitely one of my favorite things to do at 94.7 Kumbu. It's, it's not one of those things that you would see in a job description. I don't know if you could write a job description for radio host, but that was, that was something that I unexpectedly love and, and derive so much satisfaction from doing. Esme, what's the biggest thing that you see that um, has evolved in radio over the past few years? Mm, that is a good question. Um, you know, I'd have to draw a larger picture and talk about the evolution of media in general and then come real specific to radio. So I, I think anyone knows, um, you know, uh, the, the evolution of digital, the internet changed everything about the way that we consume information. So um, all of my journalism colleagues in print and broadcast, et cetera, have all had to evolve to learn how to uh, embrace that digital mode of conveying information. Um, in the end, good journalists are not only do we, you know, we don't just report facts, we are storytellers. And so learning how to do that effectively through multiple channels, it's not enough for a radio host to talk on the radio anymore. You have to be able to shoot your own video and edit. You have to be able to get on social media and talk live like this. Um, you have to be able to, you know, do your own PR and, and represent a brand because branding is so much of what happens in social media as well as all the other channels. Um, you have to understand promotions and marketing. Um, so there are so many ways and you have to be able to write because they expect you to blog, they expect you to post. So you have to be, I think anybody who is in media these days, whether your primary job is radio or TV or print or digital, you really are what we call um, uh, a, an MMJ. And an MMJ is a multimedia journalist. You have to be ready and, and able to do any of those things, move in any of those types, those genres of media um, to get your story across, to get the facts across. I think that is one of the major ways that it's evolved. The other thing that I think about is that I think media in general, unfortunately, uh, over the past <clears throat> four years or so, <laughs> uh, unfortunately has been under attack. And with the evolution of the internet as well, one of the problems is that, um, God bless, I love that the internet makes storytelling and fact communication more accessible. Anybody can jump on the internet. Anybody can tell a message, tell a story, shoot a video, et cetera. What's missing and what's unfortunately been under attack in, the, in recent years is um, trained, curated, reliable, fact-based journalism. There is a need for that still. Yes, we need bloggers. Yes, we need citizen journalists, but we also need trained journalists to be able to help the public discern fact from fiction, investigate problems, tell the stories of things that are good things that are happening in the community. And so, um, and that responsibility falls on journalists in every genre, whether you are in radio, TV, digital, broadcast, whatever it is. Um, so that's, that's another challenge that we've had to face. That's another way that it's changed over the years. And so I think there's an extra level of scrutiny uh, with journalists these days. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that, that lights a fire under our colleagues to uh, make sure that we are reporting the facts uh, accurately and, and fairly. Esme, I got to say, I, I had a great time uh, talking with you and, and hearing your insights. Uh, and I just really want to thank you for taking time to join me on the show today. Oh, it's been an honor, Rusty. It has been an honor. And I hope, if, if nothing else, I hope um, your viewers uh, take away that, you know, that they can, whatever the adversity, you can, you can rise above it. You can be buoyant. You can be resilient. Find your voice. Find your purpose. And that's going to carry you through. Totally agree. Thank you, Esme. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii.
For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Esme and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.